uh, more than a couple things to talk about, uh, Rod. All right. Uh, first, let's start with the solar flares, uh, what they are, what they can do for us. And uh, I'm reading that uh, this is the biggest solar flare uh, in 10 years. Yeah, this is a biggie. There was one back in 2003 that measured X28. This yeah. is a lot smaller than that. This is X9.2 something now, of 9. course 3. you see i thought but, it was 9.6 what the hell are you talking about <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> it's the oh let me back up a step there's a scale for these things oh okay and each one's a hundred times worse than the next so i think it goes c and then m and then x so x sounds nasty is nasty so we had two a couple days ago uh one was x 2.3 uh, eight, and then the other one was nine point three. All right, so I should have started off with that. that so would, yeah, that helps. It's a big one. All right, yeah. so what? How do? What are they about? What are they formed? And what do they do to us that uh, everybody's really concerned about these massive solar flares? You know, the magnetic field of the sun looks like a bag of snakes, and every now and then these things pop up above, above, above the surface. They snap. When that happens, they can release a bunch of light, which is, which is a flare. And then they can also release uh, more potentially dangerously what's called a coronal mass ejection, which is a bunch of magnetic particles that are heading towards Earth. Now, when we see a flare, which is what we're talking about here, it's a flash of light, gets the Earth in about eight minutes, and it can cause uh, mainly inconvenience. It can mess electronics and satellites. It can screw up GPS briefly you might have some data disruption in terms of banking and so forth it's the coronal mass ejections they're most concerned about and we're still looking to see if there's one of those headed this way from this event those can knock out the power grid temporarily they can knock out satellite take a scrub gps including in-flight airplane navigation so that's a little more of a concern all right so uh when uh, you're talking about these solar flares and obviously uh satellites and phone systems etc uh, GPS systems, uh, when they're manufactured, they anticipate a solar flare because obviously they, they happen uh, fairly regularly. Is there such thing as a solar flare that would totally overwhelm our systems and maybe cause permanent damage? Can that happen? Uh, yeah, yeah. If it's big enough, that could happen. I mean, these systems are, are not hardened like the military, obviously. They're they're designed to be disruption resistant. It's like the difference between water resistant and waterproof in your camping gear. You know, one will actually keep you dry and the other one kind of does its best attempt to keep the rainwater out. So they are pretty robust. And fortunately, we live at the, uh, underneath our atmosphere in the Earth's magnetic field, which is really what's doing the bulk of the work. That's what's protecting us from this stuff. If you're an astronaut on your way to the moon back in the Apollo era and one of these th- things happened, you got a big dose of radiation and that would be a bad thing. So, yeah, if we get a big enough one, we'll have some serious problems, and that's when we got to start worrying about grid failures and so forth. And has there ever been one that has uh, reached that level? Uh, Quebec's grid was taken down for, I think, nine hours back in the late 1980s, and then there was an event in 1967, a big flare, which caused a uh, scare within the uh, Western militaries. They thought that it was... Uh, Soviet radio jamming, so they went on full alert for a while until they figured out that it was an astronomical event. All right, fair enough. Let's move over to uh, a black hole, a new black hole discovered. And those are weird things, those black holes, but we're talking about right in the middle of the Milky Way, correct? Our own galaxy. Yeah, and we've known for a while that, that galactic cores tend to have black holes. This seems to be part of their evolution. Early on when the universe was forming 14 billion years ago or so, there were these huge clusters of stars They didn't last very long in the order of hundreds of millions of years. When they collapsed, some of them formed these large black holes. And somehow these things are intricately involved with the formation of galaxies and positioning of galaxies. So we've known there's a black hole at the center of our galaxy that's about 4 million solar masses for a long time. Now by tracking some of the gases on on the rim of the core itself... Uh, and how you do that, you know, that's another whole discussion. But by tracking the motions of those, they see that there's another black hole that's, quote, only, unquote, about 100,000 times the mass of our sun. Okay, so, so these two uh, things are doing a dance. All right, so uh, explain to us uh, what a black hole is, because usually in my life, a black hole is my daughter's with my credit card. <laughs> I'm not, yeah, And I'm not or, exaggerating either. So, uh, or any teenager's bedroom. Uh, right? yeah, 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 for sure. So uh, what what are these things? Sun three times the size of ours or larger can become a black hole. These they collapse and they just create this gravitational pit basically in time space. And if they're big enough, they start sucking in all the the matter around them, 
and they essentially become this big minus sign in the mathematics of the universe, and they they wreck everything nearby. There's all kinds of weird physics that happen in terms of the event horizon, and from our point of view, time stops the event horizon, but if you're being sucked in the black hole, it continues and so forth, and that's how movies get made. Yeah, it's really, it's really bizarre, because you're talking about a star that's collapsing, but there's nothing there. I mean, does it go into a new galaxy on the other side? I mean, are we really talking Star Trek here? Well, that's a wormhole. Black holes don't oh, yeah. get okay. quite that far. And, and this stuff's all theoretical anyway. I mean, obviously, we, we observe them, but only indirectly. You just observe right. kind of where the light is not happening. You can observe lensing. So if you see a galaxy passing behind a black hole in space, it gets warped and bent and so forth. We kind of saw that in effect in the movie Interstellar, but you can't observe them directly because there's no light there, right? They're so powerful, they're pulling all the light and the energy inside. What you can see sometimes is is uh, X-rays and so forth, gamma rays, but they're just this big absence of stuff. So, you know, what exactly they do at the galactic core and why they need to be there, uh, there's a theoretical construct, but it's something that they're still collecting a lot of material on. But it's kind of cool that there's another big one discovered there. All right, so uh, you talked about that they're in tandem. Are these uh, circling each other uh, like two stars do? Uh, because this is a new one, much smaller, you said. Is it near the uh, the bigger one? Yeah, I don't exactly know. You know, the articles were little vague on all that it just uh, said that we're 30,000 roughly 25 to 30,000 light years from the center so it's it's a little hard to observe and that's something they're still figuring out beyond that i didn't get a whole lot of more material all right uh good enough well we're gonna take a break and come back and talk about spacex and there is a new chapter in uh, the spacex story which i want to share with you or i want you to share with us and then uh voyager's 40th anniversary big deal with uh, voyager and we'll finish uh, the show with that. KFI right. AM 640. Okay. KFI AM 640. Bill Handel here. It is a uh, Thursday morning, just before Gary and Shannon. And uh, we're with uh, Rod Pyle, Cool Space News, uh, with uh, Rod. Uh, Rod, let's move into SpaceX. And uh, what is going on? It never occurred to me uh, that... Uh, number one, that SpaceX could do a secret project, which makes sense because it puts satellites up there. And when you're dealing with private companies putting up spacecraft, do they even see the satellite or does it come like wrapped up in aluminum foil so they don't know what's inside? No, I think they got to see it because they've got to integrate it in their rocket. So in this particular case, this is the X-37B, which is the Air Force's mini shuttle. And originally, this was supposed to fly only on ULA rockets, so the Atlas, which is SpaceX's primary competitor in the launch business. And it was supposed to fly just perched on top of the rocket. After looking at the aerodynamics and so forth, they said, no, we've got to put it in a big nose cone or a fairing. So they've been doing that ever since. Now, I don't know if it's delivered to SpaceX within the fairing or not, but as part of the so-called integration of making sure all this stuff is happy together before it launches – they got to be able to look over just about everything. And, you know, on the civilian side, we're really still not sure exactly what the X-37B does. We know that it goes up there, hangs out for anywhere from one to two years, and does a lot of experimental things. There's some talk about maybe it was observing the Chinese space station, doing some spy work up there, but they still haven't really told us what it actually does. Uh, is SpaceX, uh, are they looking for or receive contracts from uh, corporations, governments overseas? Um, not actively, I don't think. I mean, they're open to business from anybody, but there are issues with ITAR, you know, the whole international trade and arms rules, uh, that make that kind of a little more complex. So it's something they can do, but primarily they've been concentrating on domestic life. Actually, that's not true. I should take that back. They have done a couple of missions where they did do, uh, uh, smaller civilian stuff. They certainly can't do overseas military. But, uh, you know, the bulk of their consumers, of their customers, rather, have been from the U.S. and now from the Air Force. They had to sue to get these Air Force contracts because uh, United Launch Alliance was locked up in a monopoly with the Air Force. And, and SpaceX had to apply a crowbar to get that deal to move ahead right. a couple of years ago. All right. Let's move over to Voyager, 40th anniversary. And even as uh, it disappeared, uh, it still was sending information back at the last second evening uh, so let's let's talk about what uh, some some of the highlights real quickly. We have about three four minutes. Okay, and this is one of those JPL success stories that gets us so excited. Forty years on, these things are still transmitting to Earth. 
Uh, Voyager 1 has left the solar system. Voyager 2 is, is making that crossing now. It's kind of a vague area as to exactly when it leaves. But these were both launched in 1977. Uh, they flew past Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, uh, not Pluto. Uh, Voyager 1 sort of took a, a right turn to go look at Titan. And it was really the first time we got a good look at these worlds. We discovered dozens of more moons, learned about the radiation fields, learned about temperature and atmospheric pressure and all this stuff. So while this science sounds just like big science, it's also this real look into something that had mystified people for hundreds of years. What are these outer planets like? We had sent a couple of Pioneer spacecraft out there before, but they were very small mm. and simple. So the Voyagers are really the first mission that gave us this incredible look, and they're still being tracked all these years later. Where, where, which uh, satellite, which uh, spacecraft am I thinking about that just entered into or will enter into uh, the atmosphere of Saturn uh, and transmitting as it goes down into it? That's Cassini. That's on Got September it. 15th. That's the end of mission. Yeah, that's that's going to plunge into Saturn, and they'll get some data right up to the last second, like you said. And then when it's over, it's over. But Voyager just keeps going. 40,000 years, each of the Voyager spacecraft will pass within a couple of light years of another star system. And if we're lucky, they'll get picked up, and somebody will play that phonograph record, which thoughtfully NASA put a, a, a needle and a cartridge on there, too. Yeah, because you never know uh, when they uh, when you need a vinyl record. I think it's gold, though, isn't it? Uh, it's either gold plated or it's gold plated. Yeah, and so it's it's got some value to it. So if they don't have jukeboxes. Maybe they can get a few bucks for it in their stellar swap meet somewhere. That was done during the uh, the Nixon years, wasn't it? When they put that one together. Uh, yeah, early to mid seventies, yeah. and that was Carl Sagan's baby, and and he was very passionate about it, and it's a very, very cool thing. It's this very early digital recording on an analog format of of i think 154 images and different sounds and uh I know, some, you know modern music classical yeah, the whole shot yeah so some really songs cool. uh richard nixon saying i'm not a crook in uh 200 different languages it was uh, i think actually it was jimmy carter that put the message on oh really i thought it was, i thought it was nixon uh and, the, and and what i thought was really neat about it it was the the way that it was mathematically uh, that they uh, put a an image of uh, how tall a man is, and then a, an entire mathematical formula on the assumption that math is the same no matter where you are in the universe. Right, right. And there's a lot of controversy about the male and female figure because can we show them naked? Well, if we show them with clothes, are they going to think that's that we evolved skin that looks like a belt and so forth? So that went back and right. forth quite a bit, and they finally had to kind of airbrush out some of the features, Very quote funny. unquote. All right, Rod, but, yeah. uh, we are out of time. We'll pick it up again. Rod, uh, the uh, website is pyle, P-Y-L-E, books.com, and it's all the great news. Also, there's a podcast uh, KFIAM640.com, and the keyword is cool space news. Rod, you have a good one. 